is a world of imagination, hopes, and dreams. Here we go! Someday, I'm going to be a real boy. Nothing's impossible. Even miracles take a little time. All it takes is faith and trust. In this timeless land, magic and make-believe come true. In 1957, Walt Disney announced with great fanfare that his studio was going to produce a musical feature film called The Rainbow Road to Oz. Walt enlisted his merry band of Mouseketeers, many of whom were to star in the film, to promote the idea on his Disneyland TV show. Here you see are some of the characters in our story. But Walt's interest in Oz had roots going back much further, to the late 1930s when Walt was working on Snow White, a film that most of his contemporaries considered commercially unviable. Even as he was gambling his entire future on a cartoon, Walt was busy planning his next project. As a matter of fact, there's a radio show where uh, Cecil B. DeMille interviews Walt Disney on the eve of the premiere of Snow White. I suppose after Snow White is successfully launched, you'll sit back and take it easy for a while. Well, it's just the beginning for us. We're going to make more feature-length animated production. Try to make use of all that we've learned in the three years required to produce Snow White. Walt Disney's interest in the Oz stories is a real natural fit to Walt's particular personality. Because the Wizard of Oz stories have been acknowledged as being probably the first great American fantasy literature for children. It's not rooted in any European fairy tale traditions. Walt Disney in particular, coming from the Midwest, had those same roots and those same sensibilities. So Walt asked his brother Roy to investigate the possibility of getting the rights to the Oz books, and uh, he just missed out getting them because MGM had just bought them for uh, the 1939 classic. The irony is that it was the success of a Walt Disney cartoon that prompted Samuel Goldwyn to purchase rights to the wonderful Wizard of Oz book in the first place. Goldwyn was encouraged by the enormous popularity of The Three Little Pigs, which demonstrated that adults and children alike could be charmed by a fantasy film. And Samuel Goldwyn held on to the rights, and they were going to make it as a live-action musical, an expensive Technicolor production at Goldwyn. But at the same time, Paramount Pictures acquired Alice in Wonderland and made a live action version of that, which was rather disastrous. And so Goldman said, okay, let's back off. Then, at the end of 1937, Walt Disney releases Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and it's a huge hit. I mean, it had been seen by more people than any other movie up to that time. So everybody else then started thinking about, well, you know, what else can we do then? The success of Snow White erased any doubts that adult fantasy could work, and it paved the way for Goldwyn to produce his classic. Walt Disney would have to wait, but when it came to a good story, Walt had a memory as long as the yellow brick road. It would take more than a decade and the help of another Disney princess before Walt could once again pursue his dream of going to Oz. By 1950, Cinderella really relaunched the Walt Disney animation as the biggest game in town. Nobody could tell a story like Walt could. It was a tremendous success. And he started thinking about Oz again. And finally, in 1954, he did buy 11 of the Oz books to pursue his film projects. It was originally conceived as a two-part television show for the evening network program that Walt was doing. And this is going to be Walt Disney's first foray into a live action musical fantasy. And he saw it as a great property for the Mouseketeers. Well, we were in our last season of the Mickey Mouse Club. At this time, uh, Bobby, Annette, Karen and Cubby, all of us were starting to reach our teen years. And word got out that he was going to go forward and he was going to take one of the books and produce it. And I was so excited. The summer of 1957, Dorothy Cooper is drafting a screenplay. The musical team of Buddy Baker and Tom Adair were starting to write songs. And at one point, it's announced as a two-part television show. And yet, within a month, it was already being planned as a feature film. To help promote the idea on the beginning of Walt Disney's 57, 58 television season, they had a sequence where the Mouseketeers come up to Walt Disney and say, hey, since the studio now owns the rights to the Oz stories, why not do a musical and can we be in it? Now, I'm going to make a picture out of the Oz stories. I got asked to be the scarecrow. So I did a song and dance. She'll go dancing along 
our happy little patchwork way. And then the end of our Rainbow Road to Oz TV show was this big cake, and we danced around to the top of it, and then fireworks came out of it and all, and we were singing this great song, the Rainbow Road to Oz song, which has stayed with me all these years. Up we go, the rainbow-covered skyway. Up we go, the rainbow road to Oz. And then they had Mr. Disney come on, but his expression was sort of like, okay, that's it, that's a wrap. You could see the brakes and the cylinders going back and forth, and he was thinking, oh, maybe not. And Annette said, I, I don't see him smiling. I think at that point he was probably thinking, no, I don't think it's gonna work, before anyone really knew. The word came down, so. Doreen and Annette's premonition that day was correct. It was less than six months later that rumors began circulating in Hollywood that the Rainbow Road to Oz was going nowhere, and Oz was to remain an elusive destination for Walt Disney. So, okay, let's not do Oz right now. It's not quite ready. Let's do Babes in Toyland. So that became Walt's first live action musical. So if you look at what Walt Disney ultimately made as his first musical, you can kind of get an idea of what Rainbow Road to Oz might have been. And it's a lovely film. It is not so much a film though as it is a very elaborate television special, a super spectacular TV special. Very much on a stage, they don't hide that it's on a stage, but not a motion picture. At the same year that Babes in Toyland came out, West Side Story came out, Flower Drum Song came out. You had a little bit more sophistication in musicals than you'd had, and the form was changing. So by the time Walt made Mary Poppins three years later, he made a very different movie than he might have made with Oz and he did make with Babes in Toyland. So you can really trace that through from Walt's first live action musical. Rainbow Road to Oz didn't happen, Babes in Toyland did happen, and from that, he knew we need to go outside the studio. We've got to get Broadway caliber talent and getting Julie Andrews, you know, from Broadway and really doing a much bigger scale production of Mary Poppins. So I think what he learned from the uh, process led him to make the greatest film he ever made that brought together all of the things that he loves so much. Mary Poppins probably owes a debt to the Oz uh, project that uh, never, never was. But Oz was not dormant. You know, typical of, of Walt's like, well, where else can we do something with Oz? They started developing an attraction at Disneyland. And he decided to have his Imagineers look into the possibility of including some of the Oz characters inside the Storybook Land ride. And this was gonna be for a thing called Big Candy Mountain. And inside Big Candy Mountain was where the Emerald City was gonna be. And the plan was to go through the ride and see all the characters that you love from the Oz uh, films and the books. It took it quite far in terms of development, but it never quite came to fruition. Jimmy Johnson, who was president of the record company, knew the books were there, and he was adapting a lot of stories for records. And he adapted The Wizard of Oz. One of the first albums they did do was The Scarecrow of Oz, based on the Bound book, starring Ray Bolger, and narrating it, perhaps the only other time he actually played the role of the Scarecrow again. And more albums followed. The record albums enjoyed considerable success, but Walt Disney died in 1966 without ever seeing any of his large-scale Oz projects realized. But in the 1980s, there was an effort to attract a more adult audience to Disney films. And ultimately, out of that came The Return to Oz, which was released in 1985, which finally became Disney doing a live-action production based on the Oz books. The director was Walter Murch, who was a very well respected by the, the film community. So he made his directing debut on Return to Oz. I mean, Return to Oz is groundbreaking in a lot of ways. The claymation sequence at the end is phenomenal. It's just a very sort of apocalyptic world, which was close to some of the L. Frank Baum books, but certainly not something that Walt probably would have made himself. But it has developed a cult following. And then Walt's Road to Oz traveled on into a new century finally ending with the production of Oz the Great and Powerful by the studio he created. 
a bold, beautiful, and beguiling movie worthy of the great wizard himself.